Hello and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. This is week 3, segment 4, and we're going to wrap up our discussion of partitions and file systems, to the extent that we're covering them on this high level. When we left off in our previous video, we had shown that we can mount the file system we created on our partition and then create files there, so perhaps now would be a good time to look a bit more closely into what types of files the Unix file system supports and how they behave before we then consider and what partitions and file systems are typically mounted on the systems we consider in this class. Here, let's have a look. Here is an empty directory containing, as usual, the two entries dot and dot dot, referencing the current and parent directory respectively. We create a regular file which ls then shows as such by leaving the first character of the permission string as a dash. Next, we create a directory which ls then identified by a link d. Each of these is now an entry in our current directory. As we mentioned before, each file is referenced by an inode, which contains all the metadata associated with it, the permissions, ownership, timestamps, etc. And it is the file name existing in this directory here that creates the reference to the inode. And while we generally do not call them that, every single file name to inode mapping is called a hard link. But we can have multiple names for the same file. So if a file already exists, we can link another directory entry to it. To do that, we use the ln command. There. Now these two files are indistinguishable other than by name. More accurately, they are not two files, but they are two names for one and the same file. We can verify this by looking at the inode number of the files, which ls shows us by passing the dash i flag. As we see here, our directory has one inode number and the two regular files share the same inode. That is, as far as the system is concerned, they are the same file, and ls also tells us over here that there are two names for this file. This number here is the link count, the number of names that exist for this file in the file system. But there's also another type of link, a so-called symbolic link, which is created when using the S flag to ln. The difference here is now that we can see that the symbolic link is indeed a separate file. It has its own inode number and the file type is shown as L. A symbolic link, then, is a special type of file that simply says, hey, don't look at me, look at that guy, for any operation. The ls command also shows us the target of the symbolic link in the output. So when we read the file, what we get back is the contents of the file it points to. Okay. So we've seen files of type directory, regular file, which is really only a different way of saying hard link, and symbolic links. But there are other types of files. One of them is a FIFO. A FIFO is effectively the manifestation of the concept of a pipe in the file system, and behaves just like one too. Anything written to the FIFO can be read from it in that order. LS, therefore, uses the P character to indicate a FIFO, also known as a named pipe. The behavior of a FIFO can be a bit surprising on first use. But to illustrate, let's start a process that reads from the FIFO in the background. We can then cat the symlink, which redirects to the regular file, into the FIFO. At which time, the backgrounded cat process reads the data and prints it to standard out. When we hit return again, the shell tells us that the background process has completed. We also know that apparently not all messages generated by the shell correctly support UTF-8 characters, 
but that also serves as a good reminder that while file names can contain characters other than just ASCII, as we are showing here, that may not always be a good idea. Anyway, let's take a look at what other file types we can find. Let's create a few hard links to existing path names in the current directory. And then we ask the file command to report on all of them. There we go. Now we see a FIFO, a character special device, such as a TTY, for example, a block special device, such as a hard drive, a directory, regular files containing UTF-8 Unicode, a symbolic link, and a socket, an inter-process communications rendezvous point in the file system that provides access to the sockets API for communications between processes on the same host. Here, ls-li shows us more information, where again the first letter of the permission string gives us the type of file. So those are the different types of files you would likely encounter in a normal Unix system. There are a few other types of files, but some of them are implementation specific to the operating system in question. Either way, let's now take a look at what file systems we find mounted by default on the different Unix versions we consider. First, FreeBSD. Here we see that the root file system is mounted from def gpt rootfs, suggesting the use of a GUID partition table. The mount command shows what file systems are currently mounted, and doesn't differ from the output of df in this case. Ok, so far so good, simple enough. Now let's look at OmniOS. We've done this before, but just to recap. When we run mount, we see a rather different view, with several other things showing up as being mounted. That is, we have our root file system, which we know to be on a ZFS pool, as well as several special purpose pseudo file system. Let's look at the mount tab manual page. This is one of those weird things where we project information from the running system into the file system, making it appear as a regular file. So, looking at Etsy mount tab, we find no surprises. The same file systems mounted as shown before. How does the OS know which things to mount? Let's look at the VFS tab manual page. Now this is an actual file, a configuration file describing the defaults for mounting file systems at boot time. Let's take a look at that file. There. This describes which things to mount, as well as what type of pseudo file system to use for the given special mount point. Alright, now let's compare to Linux and Fedora Linux in particular. Again, df gives us some information here, showing the use of some special file systems like tempfs as well as the disk-backed root file system. Now, if we run mount, then, whoa, that's a lot of things showing up there that we didn't see when we ran df. Look at all that. Fedora nowadays uses systemd to bootstrap and manage the running system, so we get a whole bunch of extra weirdnesses stashed in here. We see tempfs, deffs, control groups, etc., etc., all with the respective mount flags shown here on the right. Let's see what manfstep says on this system. The etcfstep file contains information about which file systems can be mounted. When we look at the file, We note that it contains only a single entry for the root file system of type ext4 and mapped to the device with a given UUID. That is quite different from what we have seen currently being mounted, so where is that information tracked? Etsy mtap points to proc self mounts using the procfs pseudo file system to reflect information about the running system into the file system hierarchy as we mentioned before. 
proc self mounts looks like so. Note that it looks like a regular file, but it's of zero byte size. Yet when we cat it, it shows us all the things just like the mount command did. So again, we notice a discrepancy between what file systems are available when running, for example, df to report on free space and what other pseudo file systems are active. For many of the pseudo file systems, it simply doesn't make much sense to report file usage, since by definition they only abstract system properties into the file API. Now all this is a bit strange, we've talked at length about disks and partitions, but most of the things we've seen here are not really file systems, nor are they backed by disks. This is to illustrate how the file system API and concepts have been so successful that we've increasingly used it for other purposes. Secondly, it's worth noting that the default layout of the AWS instances we spin up do not necessarily represent those of actual production systems for specific purposes. So let's instead show a different example. What you see here is the DF output on the server on which the course website is hosted. This is a NetBSD virtual private server, but as you can tell, here we have a more normal layout. We have a root disk that provides the operating system and is, no surprise, mounted under slash. But we also have additional disks for different purposes. We see one disk dedicated to the home directories of all the users on the system, and another disk mounted for miscellaneous data files. The OS also has a PTYFS, a kernfs and a tempfs mount, but nothing quite as crazy as the Fedora system D instance. Ok, so let's visualize how we mount our disks. Even though nowadays we frequently have one monolithic partition containing absolutely everything, we still may see different disks mounted in different places. And this is really the only stipulation we have in mounting partitions. A partition can be mounted anywhere, with the exception of the root partition, which must be mounted under slash. Now, way back in the olden days, when disk space was still expensive and sparse, it was rather common to have one disk that contained the bare minimum files needed to boot the system, and that partition would be the root partition, while another disk might contain all the additional files that would show up under user, for example and end users private files living on yet another partition. This, by the way, is one of the reasons for why we have a slash user directory instead of just providing all files under slash. We'll see in a second that there's actually some logic to this. Now as we also just saw, there are other things we can mount, but those pseudo file systems don't get represented here in the graphics since we want to draw a distinction between what data lives where. And for that, we probably will also want to think about some sort of standardization across different operating systems and consider where we want to install software, a topic we'll go into much more detail in the next week's videos. And what do we do when we want to look up some information, such about which files go where, or what the file system hierarchy should look like? Nope, we don't type which files go where into Google and then follow the first stack overflow link to some random person opining that the kernel should go under slash all my kernels. Instead, we pull up the manual page. Man here, provided by the OS, provides a description of the file system hierarchy. It notes, for example, that under bin we keep the utilities used in both single and multi-user environments. The system configuration files go under Etsy, it tells us where users data goes, where libraries go, and notes that we don't want to rely on user being available, since it might reside on a separate disk not yet available at boot time. It tells us about the location for system utilities thereby answering the question as to why we have both a bin and an sbin. Describes the user hierarchy itself, which somewhat mirrors the root hierarchy. And it tells us where various other files go, such as log files, 
and PID files. So you see, all this has some logic and reason behind it. And having this hierarchy defined and then adhered to by software providers and system administrators makes it easier for you to both use as well as maintain the system. By careful separation of these files, you can use different partitions with different mount flags and security settings, for example. Or you may be better able to budget your disk space, or avoid runaway processes eating the disk space or inodes on one partition from interfering with operations of the system as a whole. Okay, this brings us to the end of our discussion of file systems and mount points. Here are a few things for you to think about and to experiment with. Take a look at the different mounted file systems in the different operating systems, as we've shown in this video. Make sure you understand the differences and identify what each is used for. Also take a look at the mount options, that is, the way in which the file system is mounted. Many file systems allow for different behavior based on the mount flags. You may, for example, be able to mount a disk read-only, or with certain properties enabled or disabled to boost performance. Make sure you understand what all the different flags mean and why they might be employed. We also saw that sometimes there's a discrepancy between what etcf step says should be mounted and what is mounted. Try to explain under what circumstances such discrepancies arise and whether or not that's a problem. Next, think a bit about the file system. Remember at the beginning of this topic we ran some experiments trying to fill up disk space and using up inodes? Rerun those exercises and see if things make more sense now, if you've gained a better understanding. Then think about specific limitations in the file system. For example, how large can a single file be? What limits its size? We saw that we can use, for example, UTF-8 characters in the file names. What other characters can you use? What characters can't you use in a file name? Why not? How long can a file name be? Try it out. Create a file name with 100, 200, or 2000 characters. What if anything is the limit? If there is a limit, why is that? Now take that thinking beyond the file name. If each component in the path name is a file name separated by a slash, and if there's a limit on the file name length, what's the limit on the path name? If a file name is nothing but a hard link, and if you can have multiple hard links for the same file, can you have... 100? 2000? What, if any, is the limit? And finally, try to create a hard link across disks or mount points. You should find that that fails, but why is that? If you are able to answer all these questions, then you'll be in good shape and think you'll have gained a better understanding of the topics we've covered so far. But we're not quite done yet with file system hierarchies, I'm afraid. As we've seen when looking at the here manual page, there's a reason for why we put things into one place or another. But just how do the files get there? Well, we'll cover that directly and indirectly by way of software installation concepts in the coming videos. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Cheers.